Good afternoon to all of you. It is indeed a privilege for me to be here today. Um, when I was asked to speak, and I thank you for the invitation to be a part of this conference, my question to myself was, why? There are so many people that are much more capable who are dealing specifically with the issue of ex-offenders re-entry into our society, till I did not think that I was the appropriate person to speak to this body. However, when asked to do something, you have to find a way to do it. And I want to first start my comments with saying is not only do we have to be concerned about the ex-offender re-entry, I think we also need to focus on the fact that there are so many offenders and the disproportionate number of offenders who are incarcerated with the disproportionate number of African-American males being incarcerated. That's what gives us such large number of ex-offenders, particularly African-American males and Latino persons. So we first need to start and address the issue of discriminant enforcement of the law so that when the law is enforced, it's enforced equally and not disproportionately, then we won't have the disproportionate number of African-American males and Latino males who are the ex-offenders in our communities. And that is a crucial issue for us to address. It's called selective enforcement. And as I said, I speak from experience as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, as a correctional officer in the federal prison years ago, and dealing with these issues on a daily basis, whether personal or the church or the community of Los Angeles. So I know that it is a fact of life. But let's begin talking about the ex-offender. We need to change our attitude about that person who is re-entering our community. First of all, the fact that they have been incarcerated, the judge has decided the appropriate punishment and sentence for the crime that was committed, and it is time for our society to begin to accept the fact that when a person is released from prison, that he or she has served her time and has done the time for the crime. So now let them become a citizen. One of the issues crucial to me is the right to vote that is taken from ex-offenders. If in fact you have served your time for the crime committed and the punishment has been appropriate, uh, uh, has been handed down, then why are you then allowed, I mean required, for the rest of your life not to be a productive citizen or you're limited in terms of being a productive citizen and you're also limited in terms of your citizenship rights. I am quite appalled at the fact that there is legislation pending in our Congress to allow illegal immigrants who have, who have violated the law to come over here to now say to them, you can become citizens and we won't punish you for your violation of the law. But yet our citizens who violate the law and serve their time are punished when they get out because they can't vote. restoring human rights and civil rights to our ex-offenders, which is very crucial because when people feel that they are a part of the society and that they have something to offer and that their voice counts and their voice matters, when people who feel, as my father used to say, that you have a stake in the game and you have some skin in the game, then you respond a little differently. If you have nothing to lose and you don't have any skin in the game and nobody's listening to you and no one's paying attention to you, then why bother? So we need to let them know that they do count, that their voice is being heard, and that what they have to say does matter. And I'm sure that as more and more white-collar criminals, white persons who commit white-collar crimes, go to prison, as more and more legislators go to prison, as more and more about a Kentucky legislator who's been convicted of a crime, and now he's saying he's going to run England. But as more and more legislators go to prison for the illegal behavior and the, the, you know, the stealing and the bribery and all the other stuff that they get convicted of, as more and more rich people go to, to prison, like the Enron CEOs and the Martha Stewart's of America, and as more and more people 
who don't look like me go to prison. I guarantee you the rules will change, okay? The question is, why do we have to wait for that to happen? I'm, I'm not sure if Martha Stewart's going to be able to vote or not, but <laughs> as more, you know, what bothers me is that too often we as citizens cannot get behind something and cannot be concerned about the ultimate happening with an event until it affects us personally. And we need to learn that we have we don't have to wait till you're personally affected to be a concerned citizen. Now I'm preaching to the choir because all of you are concerned citizens. But this is a message we have to get out to those who are not concerned. You know, it, it, it shocks me and, and I always laugh when, when law enforcement people talk about lawyers and how dirty they are when they represent the criminal defendant and they get them out and they hate them so badly until one of them gets in trouble and gets, you know, arrested and accused of a crime. Then they want to go get that attorney that they hate the most, who they think is the most the scumbag of attorneys to represent them. It's so interesting. But when we can learn to be concerned about what's going on in our communities before we become personally affected, then it will certainly help our communities. So for those of you who are here today and are really concerned, if you can get that message out to your neighbor and to your coworkers and to your other family members that the fact that they are not ex-offenders, you know you need to be concerned about what happens to those people. Because if you're like me and like every other person, and I practice Christianity and I try my best to live according to the Bible and the rules of the, the Lord and the rules of society, but I know that there have been so many times that at a snap of a hat, I could have become an ex-offender. You know, because there have been so many times that I wanted to shoot somebody right then and there. And that's just the truth. And when you think about it, but for the grace of God, each one of us could be an So we need to change our attitude that, uh, you know, each one of us could easily be an ex-offender. So if you change, if you begin to think like that, that, you know what, this could have been me, or this could have been my child, or this could have been my cousin, or this could have been my neighbor, or it could have been my mother, or my father, then I think we can begin to change our attitudes about how we deal with these people when we see them as human beings, when we see them as ourselves, when we see them as our family. Then let's talk about how do we treat them. Uh, I think that we must understand that we will all benefit if we give them some programs and something to make them productive citizens and not just to decrease the rate of recidivism. The focus should not just be to decrease recidivism, but to increase productivity. Increase productivity. Let's start with the families. The families are the persons who are most affected directly by incarceration. So when one comes out of that system, we need to put some systems in place that allow families to reunify, to reunite, to reconnect to each other, to understand each other. One of the things that I talk about when I go into the prisons to talk to those who are incarcerated is that they need to become more understanding of what's happening with their families while they're incarcerated because it's usually the mother left to try to take care of all of the children and the mother left to come and visit all the time, and the mother left to send you the packages, and the mother left to pay that big telephone bill when you constantly call it. So when they come out, we need some programs to help them understand what is really happening with the family. Now, the mental attitude of that ex-offender, particularly the male, has to be changed to know that you don't walk in here after being in jail for a year, five years, or whatever, talking about I'm the big cheese and I'm the head of this house. No, you are not. So the attitude has to change, and you need to help them understand that things are changed and that in the last, say, five years that you've been gone, the routines have changed. Your children have grown. They've gotten older. We now have a routine in this household where this is the way we do things, and you can't walk in and want to change and upset the cha-cha because then that upsets the family. And they need to understand that. And so we have to focus on some programs and deal with them in terms of the psychological effect of imprisonment and the fact that they have been separated from the family and that there is a difference now in the family household. And not only that, five years have passed. I mean, you've been in prison 10, 20 years, God help you. You didn't know anything about computers when you went. You know, we didn't have all this HDTV. We didn't have, you know, the internet and all of this. So they need to be re 
readjusted and understand the changes in our society, the changes in technology, the changes in the school programs, the changes in the way the children look, the way the children dress, the way the children think, because they are out of touch. And we need to try to get them back in touch with the families. There needs to be some housing programs that allow the children and the fathers and the mothers to go together to understand the effects of the imprisonment. Because you, you develop a different mentality when you're living in prison. It's all about survival of the fittest. That's what I'm told. Have been there, but again, but for the grace of God, because I've done a lot of stuff. But <laughs> it's the survival of the fittest that I am told when you're incarcerated. It's all about protecting your life. It's not about protecting your family. It's not about looking out for your, your, your wife or looking out for your children or providing for them. It's about trying to stay alive while you're in there to keep from being sexually molested and all that stuff. So we need to deal with some counseling programs that help them to change the mentality and to change the focus in the way they thought they were thinking. The other thing, when you're incarcerated, it's all about me. You're feeling like, don't nobody love me. Uh, the man put me here. You know, there's this blame game. So now you have to change the mentality from the blame game to accept that you did do something wrong and you've been punished for it, but now let's see what we can do to make up for that. But you can't blame the man, you can't blame the wife because she can come see you every weekend and that anger and bitterness that they come out of jail with because the wife didn't come every weekend, they didn't get a package every time they wanted one, they didn't bring the kids all the time. They need to be refocused to understand that, look, that all was a matter of economics. And you couldn't, you know, your family member couldn't do that every time. And now let's look at this family and see what this family unit needs for survival in order for you to function as a family. What is the economics that's going on in your household and how do you contribute to that? And it's not enough for them to come out and just sit up and watch TV and collect a check while you still go to work. So you have to figure out how to integrate them into the family. Begin to teach them how to become the caregivers for the children as the, when they first come out because it's difficult to find a job. So they can help support the household by becoming caregivers for the children uh, during that time, by becoming more you know, active in the household, cleaning up. You know, reorient the thinking that now you have to contribute to your household in the manner in which you can. You may not be able to contribute economically at this point, but you certainly can contribute emotionally, and you can contribute with some hard work by cleaning that floor and mopping that floor and that. So it's really about understanding what family is all about and teaching the ex-offender to become a part of the family unit and to become integrated into the family unit. Then, after that, let's talk about some real skills. Now, most of our prison systems provide some type of skill training for the incarcerated. I'm not familiar with the state of Ohio. I haven't studied your system. But most of them provide some type of skill training for the incarcerated. They have to work at something, either becoming a cook or answering the telephones, working in the office, or being groundskeepers, or they offer some type of classes in, in plumbing and contracting. And if they don't, this is where your community colleges come into play. Give them some, some skills. Give them some training in terms of jobs and work that they can do. Find out what is the gift and talent. One thing that I have discovered about offenders is that most of them are highly gifted in something. They are highly gifted. I tell them for the, for the, for the man that steals the cars, it's like, look, if you can steal that car in two minutes, then that means you have some electrical skills in your head. And that, that your mind works like that. That you have figured out how to hotline this car and steal it in two minutes and not kill yourself in the process. That means that that person has a very high IQ in terms of electronics. But he has learned to use it in a manner that's, that's not productive as opposed to productive. The man that can take all your tires off and change them in a no time and steal all the tires off your car real quickly, that's a, pro that's a skill. They know how to tire change tires. Hire them at the local service station to change those fat tires. Get people off the freeway swiftly when 
uh, skills labor jobs, start some apprenticeship training, have somebody work under you um, or under a company, open up your own company. Uh, like I did the limousine service for an ex offender can drive a limousine, all they have to do is have a clean driving record. They've been in jail the last five years, so they got a clean driving record. Insurance company won't mind insuring it. <laughs> but of course, you have to be mindful and you have to be careful. But as I said, you have teachers going to jail for stealing. I mean, the lack of integrity in our society is at an all-time high. You have them from the from the from the preacher all the way down to the bum. You know, committing crimes of integrity. So how are you going to be so self so righteous? You know, so self righteous that you're going to now ignore these people when you don't ignore what everybody else is doing in terms of criminal behavior. So, you know, give them, teach them something in terms of skilled labor and start your own companies. I mean, community-based organizations can start businesses. 501c3s, nonprofits, you can start a business, you just can't profit by it. You have to turn the money around and use it for nonprofit. It's, it's nothing wrong with a 501c3 organization starting a lawn care service and you hire the ex-offenders to go do the lawn care under somebody's supervision, of course, because you want to make sure. But these are things that not only contribute to the beautification of our communities, but it also gives someone employment. And it contributes to our country and to our communities economically as well. Everybody needs lawn care. You have a state that has all the snow. You know, you don't want to get out there and shovel the snow. Hire people that will go throughout the community shoveling the snow. And all you have to do is call a number for the show stuff, you know, the show shoveler. Uh, the, these are things that we can do practically. The number of households being led by single women, particularly in the African American community, 70%, 70%. In the American community, I mean, in general, it's about 37% households held uh, single women, single women trying to go to work and come home half of us. We don't know how to pay. Come on, get, get some jobs. Hire somebody in the supervision. Let them come in there and paint. When my plumbing stops up, I don't have a clue what to do. These ex-offenders can be trained and skilled in plumbing so they can come in and do these repairs. They, they may not be able to get a, a plumbing license, which is again another stupid thing. They can't get the license as skilled laborers, even though they have the ability. I'm dealing with that right now. I have a family member who's an ex-offender who's an excellent plumber, but he can't take the contractor's exam for plumbing because he's an ex -go. So I just let him do my plumbing and all my friends that have need <laughs> So it keeps him employed and, and he gives back to his family and he's able to pay his rent instead of asking me to pay. So this just makes sense to me that we should teach them the skilled labors and maybe, you know, take away some of those restrictions that say people can't get licensed because they're ex-felons and ex-offenders. I mean, how do you expect them again to be productive if you take, if you tie their hands? And when people are trying to, to make a living. You know, you need fences, and you need fences built around your community, around your homes. You need y'all. I mean, there's so many things that we can do. Seniors can't get to doctor's appointments because they can't drive. You know, get a van. Get a van in the name of the community organization and just start going, going around transporting seniors to medical appointments. You have uh, young children. I mean, you have people, children who are disabled. You have a lot of disabled adults and disabled children who need to go to doctor's appointments, who need to go to therapy, who need to go to their classes, who need to go to school. You can have these ex-offenders transporting them. And of course, it has to be on a gradual basis and you need to evaluate people, but we have to do that in any job situation we want to evaluate. But you give them entrepreneurship opportunities. If you can't go get a job somewhere else, then create your own job. Um, And our churches need to become more responsive in terms of ex-offenders instead of just preaching against them. We need to, we need to uh, create some classes and some programs to assist in their rehabilitation. Uh, we leave the alcohol treatment and the drug treatment and the 
drug rehabilitation class, uh, uh, programs all to non-Christians as a general rule. The uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not by, you know, the 12-step program, but we leave it to non-Christians, you know, Narconon, all of those are not church-based organizations. But you can form a Narconon chapter in your church. You can form an AA chapter in your church. And if you don't believe in the principles of Narconon or AA, based on whatever you know, the principles you do believe in, but to talk about AA and Narconon and to say that the only way people's lives are really going to be changed from being an alcoholic or from being a drug addict is if they accept Jesus, which is the only way to abundant life, which I truly believe in. But we have to stop talking it and start showing people how. Really cuss me out when I say to him, "Come here." Yeah. 
Why are you talking like that? You can say what you have to say without using that language. <laughs> Do you know how to speak English? And usually you kind of then drop their guard and at some point you can communicate with them. Learn to communicate and talk to people one-on-one -on -one as human beings and not to just put them down. Yeah. Don't put people down. And we have to do that across the board because some of us and most of us are so self-righteous and we just really think that we're all of that and a bag of chips. And anybody who doesn't look like you, who doesn't walk like you, who doesn't talk like you, who doesn't think like you, who doesn't do it your way, we're intolerant. And we need to learn more tolerance for others and know that there's more than one way to do things. I mean, you can put some of these people on your boards when you're talking about community organizations and how we can give back to them. And I suggest to you that they can give you some ideas that you've never thought about because you don't really think like they think. And you probably haven't had the experience in the community that they have had personally. So they can give you some ideas. Open yourself up to ideas from other people, even no matter who it comes from. Um, sometimes we're so resistant to ideas from people who they don't have a title or they don't have a position. I tell the child to tell me how to do something. And if it makes sense to me, I'm going to do it. Just because the idea came from a child doesn't matter to me. And these are some of the things that we can do as members of the society who are interested in, in creating a better atmosphere for our communities who, is in, who are interested in making productive citizens out of persons whose lives who have committed crimes, who have done something wrong with their lives, but understanding that that is not the end. And the whole point of that incarceration was the punishment. Now it's time to assist them in becoming productive citizens, not only for themselves, but ultimately we benefit. Thank you. And we have a very special guest uh, that we're honored to have on the show, Judge Maybelline Ephraim. And how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing fine. One of the things that I wanted to comment on is that when you first walked through the door, we didn't recognize you at first because you had changed your hairstyle. It looks very, very nice. Um, what made you, I guess, go ahead and do that change? I'm a black woman, so I change my hairstyle on a regular basis. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, just time for a change. You look very beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Um, one of the issues that we did want to ask you about on divorce court was the issue of the black family. Um, one of the issues that has come out recently was a, um, uh, a statistic that says that 60% uh, of black women have never been married. Mm never been married and uh, between any age group um, I didn't get any age group but what would you say as far as um, the situation of a black family um, as far as black women in the state of marriage um, I, I didn't know the statistic was that great 60% of all black women have not been married I thought it's between certain ages uh, but anyway, the disparity, I know that there are a large number of us that haven't been married, but it has to do with just the whole notion of our society, and that is that uh, people don't have to be married. They can live together. They can share. Right. Um, the other, of course, has to do with the fact that there is a disproportionate number of black males incarcerated. So there are so many of them incarcerated. I'm sure another contributing factor to that statistic is there are a number of gay men. And another contributing factor is that they're dying off due to the gay violence. So there are a number of factors contributing to that. And most of all, people tend to lack commitment in terms of relationships. And people just don't want to be married. Right. And we, we seem to live in a very um, uh, unfriendly uh, society when it comes down to family. Uh, you have, uh, for instance, they have where if the woman is living in the projects where the man is not allowed to be uh, a part of that uh, family structure. That's not true. A woman okay. living in the projects is, does not, the man is not allowed to be the part of the family structure. That is not the fact. The fact is she cannot receive welfare. 
right. and have the man living in the house because the welfare is supposed to be for people who are aged to dependent children and that's for single parent families that are raising the children. Um, so the whole point is if you have a mother and a father living in the home, the welfare system is saying if both parents are there, then the parents need to be contributing and providing money for them as opposed to the government paying for their subsistence. And they will pay for the subsistence if there is one parent absent from the home. But if you allow both parents to live in the home and continue to receive government funding, all you're doing is perpetuating uh, that whole um, concept of people being irresponsible for taking care of their children. It has to become a parental responsibility to care for their children if you choose to have children and not a governmental responsibility. Right. And that's why you're suggesting that the men should live in the house. I mean, if you're going to live there and get government funding, come on, go get some, go get a job and help contribute to the household. And that, and, and I don't have any issue with it. Right, right. That's what I'm <laughs> doubt. Now, on, on your show, you, you seem to sometimes, you know, people come to your show and they want to get a divorce, but sometimes you make a decision for them to stick it out and try to make the relationship work. When I see that there is a possibility of reconciliation and that the particular issue that this couple is dealing with is something minor and that there is room for adjustment or with some counseling or with some guidance that it would lead to divorce. For instance, when people are arguing and the whole point of the marriage, people would want to break up over a financial issue because the wife spends too much money and the, and the wife says the husband is too cheap. Those are issues that can be resolved. Right. And they just simply have to learn how to resolve them. So I try to offer them a solution other than divorce. And I think people are too quick to get divorces as opposed to trying to work on the marriage. So if I see that that's what's going on and it's a possibility that that couple can work on it with some guidance and assistance, of course, I try to encourage the relationship. Now, there's a little bit of controversy, I guess, or rumors going around that, that you have left the show. It's not a rumor, uh, and it's not controversy at all. I have not left the show. I have been terminated. Uh, my contract ended. I had a seven-year contract with Fox, and at the, it was time to negotiate a new contract, and we were unable to reach an agreement on uh, the terms of the contract. And basically, uh, the terms were the money that they were offering me was substantially less than all of the other judges, and substantially less than the market based upon the shows and um, and particularly my show based upon its popularity etc so I was not able to work for that and then they had some other stipulations that really were minor compared to the money but it was like we'll give you a little bit more money if you wear your hair in the same style for the next five years all that little right. silly stuff I wasn't doing that. <laughs> I don't blame you so we were not able to reach an agreement so what are your plans for the future uh, of course, I am in, in production meetings and I am exploring the possibility of another show, uh, my own show where I have creative rights and I have ownership rights, Fox owned uh, Divorce Court, so I am uh, exploring that possibility. I'm writing a book, uh, as you heard from the introduction, I own several other businesses, right. so you know, I'm not hurting. <laughs> you, you, you do own quite a few. Yeah. And, and you have a long list, a long history of accomplishments. Right. Now, where did you get that type of motivation and drive? It really came from my, my family set. Uh, my mother and father both, uh, and my older sisters and brothers. I'm number nine of ten children. Mm. Family out of Mississippi. Just a strong work ethic principle, uh, a strong faith principle in God that you can do whatever it is that you set your mind to do. Whereas a lot of families teach their children to, to get an education and to get a job, my father was the opposite. My father was get an education and create your job and work for yourself. And so uh, out of uh, seven of my brothers and sisters, out of nine of us, all have our own businesses. So most of us have earned our income working for ourselves as opposed to working for other people. So that drive and determination comes from uh, a family you know, drive and force, and like the young lady was saying today, she decided she'd never be broke again, I'd never be broke again, I'd never be poor again, you know, right. just, a, just a desire and an innate um, sense of, in me that I can do better, and I, and I will do better, and I believe that, you know, God has gifted me with a lot of talents and a lot of ability, and, and I intend to use it to its fullest extent. Well, we won't, we won't <laughs> hold you any longer. We thank you for giving us some of your time. Thank you. And. Um, we hope to see you back on television with your own show. 
I'll be because back. we really watching Divorce Court, I think that that was not just a show like the other um, court shows, but you were really able to get something out of, it had an educational value to it. Yeah, as I often said, uh, my job, I felt that my job uh, was not just a job, that it was a mission, and it was a ministry that God had given me, and that my responsibility was not only to entertain, but to educate, to motivate, to stimulate, to advocate. So I, I believe that I was doing more than just television entertainment. So I will continue to do that, just to doing it in a different vein, do it in a different manner. And however God, you know, whatever doors he opens and however it, you know, the opportunity comes to me. So that's what I'll continue I'm to do. I'm pretty sure that you're going to be successful. Uh, I don't see any uh, falling off. I mean, you've been successful this up to this point. If television is for me, I'll be back. If it's not, I'll go up and go into something else. But the thing is, I'll move forward, not back. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and sign off. And